the chapters two and three of our textbook talk about descriptive statistics. Here in this video, I'm going to show you how to do some of those descriptive analyses with Python in Jupyter Notebook. We will demonstrate that with two examples, one from the textbook, the other from a project I did a couple of years ago. The data files associated with these two examples are on our course website. In this first example, I want to show you how to describe a categorical variable. We know that Coca-Cola, Diet Coke, Dr. Pepper, Pepsi, and Sprite are five popular soft drinks. The file softdrink.csv contains the data that show the soft drink selected in a sample of 50 soft drink purchases. With a small data set like that, we can get some rough idea about, for example, which soft drink is more popular. Let's see how we can do that. First, I define a list called brand. It has all the five soft drink brands as its elements. Now we can open the data file and read it into the computer memory. Here, our data file is in the working directory along with this Jupyter Notebook file. It saves a lot of trouble. This is the way I like to open a file because by doing so, I don't have to worry about forgetting to close the file. The information in the file is stored in a variable named data. Let's print down the data and see what it's like. Apparently, all the information is in one column, one value per row. The first row is the field name or header, brand, purchased. And the remaining 50 rows contain the name of the soft drink brand of each purchase. Next, Let's work on the frequency and the relative frequency distributions. I used list comprehension over here. Recall that the five brand names are in the order of Coca-Cola, Diet Coke, Dr. Pepper, Pepsi, and Sprite. So out of the 50 soft drink purchases in the sample, 19 of them purchased Coca-Cola, 8 of them purchased Diet Coke, the remaining 5, 13, and 5 of them purchased Dr. Pepper, Pepsi, and Sprite, respectively. And we add all those 5 frequencies, sometimes I call absolute frequencies together. No surprise, they sum up to 50. The related frequency is nothing but the ratio of frequency and total count. In our example, of course, the total count is 50. So we have the related frequency distribution here. 38% purchased Coca-Cola, 16% purchased Diet Coke, and so on and so forth. Now let's use pie chart to do some simple visualization. First, we use the matplotlib inline command to ensure the proper display of the graph. We then import the PyPlot module from matplotlib library. I want to give each piece of pie a different color. To that end, I created this list named color and randomly chose five colors. We then call the pie method associated with PyPlot to draw the pie chart. I'd encourage you to play with those parameters to see what differences they make. By doing so, I'm sure you can plot a much better looking chart than mine. Well, here's mine. It looks okay. We can also plot bar chart. Here's how to do it. The range function used over here is to tell Python that we want to have five bars in the chart, bar 1 through bar 5. By using the x ticks method, we give each bar a name. Of course, they are named after the soft drink brand names. 
Here's my bar chart for frequency distribution in our example. To plot a bar chart for relative frequency distribution, all we need to do is to replace freak with relative freak. And we're done. It's always a good idea to provide appropriate labels and legends for good readability of your chart. Let's switch gear to describing quantitative variables. The example here came from a sport-related project I did in 2016. In that project, I tried to use rookie season performance of a professional basketball player in the NBA to predict whether he would become an all-star player some point in his career. The data set has 2,763 NBA players drafted from 1953 to 2016. The data set includes all the current active players who were drafted in and before 2016. One success story from my project is that in 2016, my models predict that Kimba Walker of Charlotte Bobcats would be an all-star. And indeed, he became an all-star and was part of 2017 NBA All-Star Game. The data file NBA.csv provided has seven attributes. They are player ID, first name, last name, binary variable is all-star or not, draft year, minutes per game, and points per game in rookie season. Here, I introduce a slightly different way of opening a CSV file. I use the CSV library. Everything else is very similar to what we did in the first example. Here, we read the data file into a variable named reader. As in many other data files, the first row is the header. Let's print it out. It indeed includes the seven attributes mentioned earlier. Since our focus is on quantitative variables, here I saved minutes per game and points per game into two lists named MPG and PPG. For the sake of demonstration and curiosity, here I also printed out all the all-star players who scored less than five points per game in their rookie season. There are some familiar names here. The one that stood out to me is Steve Nash. I had 30 models in my project. None of them were able to predict that Steve Nash would be an all-star based on his rookie season performance. But we know that not only had he been an all-star multiple times down the road, but he'd been league MVP twice. So this is one failure story on my project. Not that Steve Nash was a failure, but my models failed to correctly predict his career success. Now, let's take a quick look at some numeric measures. Looks like on average, each rookie player gets to play 15.3 minutes per game in his rookie season and averages about 6 points per game. Here, I also printed out the maximum values of MPG and PPG. The highest MPG of a rookie is 46.4 minutes per game, and the highest PPG is 37.6 points per game. I can tell you that these two values belong to the same player. Possible fans would know who that player is. Okay. Let's plot a histogram for points per game. The histogram plotted here is a normalized one, meaning that it is relative frequency or percentage we are plotting on y-axis. The parameter that controls it is normed. True or one here means normalize the chart. A quick look says that about 15% of all rookies scored roughly 2 to 3 points per game in their rookie season. 
how to find something that is easier than plotting a box plot. Here we actually have a side-by-side uh, -side box plot comparing MPG with PPG. Those graphs and figures are nice, but we will probably need more accurate quantitative values for those numeric measures mentioned in the chapter 3 of our textbook. There are many ways of getting those numeric measures. Two popular choices in Python are NumPy library and SignPy stats module. Here are just a few simple examples of how to use NumPy or stats libraries to find some quantitative descriptions of data. For example, we can use percentile method in NumPy to find the three quartiles of points per game and use IQR methods of stats module to compute the IQR of points per game. Let me explain the z-score method of stats module a little more. Here, we used a variable freak from our first example because the second example contains too many data points. Once again, recall that the five soft drink brands are Coca-Cola, Diet Coke, Dr. Pepper, Pepsi, and Sprite. Here, the five z-scores are associated with each of these five brands. The results show that the number of purchase of Coca-Cola is 1.677 standard deviations above the sample mean. The number of purchase of Diet Coke is 0.37 sigma below the sample mean. Here, the sample mean is 10 because in our sample, there is a total of 50 purchases of five soft drink brands. So on average, there should be 10 purchases for each brand. Now, let's quickly plot the scatter of minutes per game against points per game. It is obvious that points per game is strongly and positively correlated to minutes per game. As you probably heard numerous times, correlation does not imply causation. To wrap up this video, let me quickly introduce a couple of ways of computing covariance and correlation coefficient with NumPy and stats. NumPy uses an array or matrix to show the results. As we can see that both methods generate the same coefficient of correlation. Technically, the correlation coefficient we typically talk about is Pearson correlation coefficient. That's why you see Pearson R when using stats module. The second value over here is zero, returned by stats Pearson R. It is a two-tailed p-value. Don't worry about it if you don't know what that is at this moment. We will have in-depth coverage of p-value in chapter 9.